spend a little bit more time on this slide because this is the essence of modeling. Answers many questions, raises many questions. First of all, why, if it's a concrete building, should we use solid model or not? Is this model the most accurate one or not? Do you understand the difference between these models, right? Okay, so what do you think about this one? What is your comment for this model? Because in this model we can mesh everything, every column, every plate, we do not make any assumption. Every dimension, everything is, is accurately modeled, so to speak. So why I did not mark this as the most correct model? Let's put it this way, what is, which one is going to be most accurate? This one. Because we are not going to make any assumptions. If we can model it correctly, this should be the most accurate model. But the word is correctly. We cannot model a reinforced concrete slab correctly by using ordinary solid elements. We can, but you need special elements with reinforcement inside and cracking included, right? So this becomes, it can be done, but it's extremely complicated. Complex model will be correct enough. So because we cannot make model it correctly, so even if though it looks very accurate, it's not correct. That is the problem. For example, in post concrete slabs crack, we cannot model that easily here. Columns crack, reinforcement is there, their properties change because of that, we cannot model that easily here. Transform properties, crack properties. So because we cannot model things correctly for this type of model, the results will be not correct, even though it looks very accurate. So that's, this model is the best one, most appropriate one, most suitable one and if used correctly, most accurate one also, right, within that. And the reason is that we can model the columns, we can include the, the properties of the reinforcement there, we can include the non-linearity of the stress strain, we have already done that in the previous course, you remember, you put the confinement, you, all of those you couldn't do here. It would be almost impossible or very hard to include the confinement effects in that model, in the solid element. Right? For the reasons, not because this is not good, reasons that we are looking for things that are not here. Primarily non-linearity, primarily the reinforcement being inside, which is not going to be easy here. There are solid elements which have reinforcement inside and you can do that, but it's way too difficult, not practical. Also, to model this column correctly, you will need hundreds of elements here instead of just one element here. So when the building becomes very large, it will become impossible to model like that. So practically and also from the properties that we need and the answers we need is that because here solid elements will not give you bending moments or shear forces. They do not have those properties. They only have stresses and strains. So if you want to know the bending moment, you cannot because that output isn't available there. So both output and input is not suitable for this. However, if this was made from a single material like plastic, or steel, solid steel, solid element will be perfect. It will be very accurate and correct. Nothing to do, no problem. But because of the reinforced concrete, we can't use it in our field so much. This one used to be the preferred model a while ago. Now nobody uses it, almost nobody uses it. We still use this model sometimes when the nonlinearity becomes too difficult for the slab and I will talk about that later. So we use the concept of equivalent beams to replace the slab. So for example, instead of modeling the slab, 
by shell elements or plate elements we take half the slab and use an equipment property and use a beam there like a white beam or put the beam and the slab together as a T beam or a L beam and use an equivalent beam. So we can replace the slab by equivalent beams and equivalent columns. I talked about this when we talked about flat slab last time. Remember? Equivalent frame, equivalent columns. So we can still use the concept of equivalent frame and we still need it because of the nonlinearity difficulty in the slabs. This is something that we should or could use if the because it's symmetrical. So if the loading is also symmetrical and geometry is symmetrical, you can cut it in the half and only analyze part of that into 2D. Of course, now almost nobody would use that, but it is still a very good way of understanding the behavior of the things because it's clean, 2D. You can understand it, you can calculate hand calculations. This is still good because the top slab can be modeled and its columns can be replaced by the vertical support if we are only interested in the slab behavior, we are not interested in the columns, then that is a good model. Right? So you should understand the limitations and usage of all of these models before you create. So you could be creating any of these models when we are doing the analysis or combination of these models for different purposes. So every model is correct depending on the purpose and if we use it correctly. And every model can be incorrect if we do not model correctly even though it may look very accurate. Local model. As I told you that sometimes we need to study the local behavior of something like a small piece, we want to know what are the stresses here, what's going on. So even a small piece can be modeled in thousands of elements, solid elements. And then we can study the behavior of those components. So it's quite possible that a small mechanical you know, model or a mechanical element model of this glasses so that it won't break. It normally it doesn't break, I drop it many times. So somebody must have done a good finite element modeling for this one including everything. So they modeled it in solid elements with everything and then it would be very accurate because they are going to make it any time, it's very expensive, so they can afford it. Right? So sometimes small objects we can create micro models and then we can create them in a lot of detail and then we can spend a lot of time studying them. Sometimes we use combination of macro and micro modeling. For example, if I go back, you could do first a model like this and get the bending moment in the column and this location and then you could create a very fine model of that joint alone with all the details, reinforcement inside, cracking, you want to check the behavior of the joint and then you apply the forces that you got from the big model on a free body. You know the concept of free body, right? So you make a free body model of that joint and create a local model of that very fine model for subsequent study and then apply the forces. Maybe there is, this is, this is, there is a bolt here and you want to study the bolt, you can create a very detailed model of the bolt and the threads and everything around that and apply the forces and try to see how the bolt will come out or not. Right? Even each thread of the bolt can be modeled. So we can always go to that level, washers, gap between the bolt, tightening. We can go into any amount of detail depending upon what is the purpose of the analysis. So there is a big field called multi-scale modeling. Multi-scale modeling is that you can model things at bigger scale and go down, 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 like a zoom. Big, and then you zoom, 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 and then you can go into even at a molecular, molecular level, nano models from the same big model. So they are all integrated. They are coming from the same big model going down, 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 like that. Right? And this is an area that I would like to do some more research on multi-scale modeling. Or we can 
create, maybe next year we'll offer a thesis on this one. Or we can create multi scale models to investigate the behavior right down to the final point and build them up, build them down, automatically creating models and transferring the boundary conditions, transferring the policy forces down. Right? So it could be possible that you have a big, big model like this and somebody wants to know what is going on here. You zoom onto that one, and while we are zooming, we create a sub model at that time and analyze it so we can see the details. So, the model is not really analyzed completely. We mesh it at the time that we are zooming in and do the analysis at that time and get the results. So, it will seem that we have the detailed results for the entire building, but actually, we don't. Right? So, that can, kind of modeling could be done, and when the computers become faster and everything, it could be real time. right? Or it could take, take a while, a little slow zooming. So that's the kind of thing that we would like to work on. All right. This is the element-based model. Element-based model means that you have a shear wall, you mesh it, you have a slab, you mesh it, you have means, you mesh it. Everything you have to create the mesh by yourself and connect the mesh by yourself. We almost don't do that anymore. The key, key problem is identify basic issues and need for modeling and then show, see how materials are presented in model. Very important. The main problem, as I said in the modeling, is materials. How are you going to represent the material? Where are you going to get all the properties? In finite element analysis, we can put thousands of properties that you need, not thousands, hundreds of properties that you need. So these are basically, that's all you have. These are the three types of main elements that you have that are available to you to be used. Of course, when you go to ANSYS or other programs, they might give you hundreds of elements, but they're all derivatives of the same elements. Right? Different is, difference is how they are implemented, what properties they have, and so on and so forth. And there are solid elements with reinforcement inside, which is smeared. That means every reinforcement is assumed on each direction. Right? And then the smeared cracking, so every cracking, the, you know, we calculate the average stress and we do the tracking. So, it's a lot of stuff there. So, we need to understand these basically three these elements line, 2D, 3D, and behavior element, which I will talk about later. Modeling approaches this is what now the object based programming looks like. You don't mesh anything, you just tell them. This is my column, this is my slab, you have seen it in tabs, and then the program comes in and it does all the meshing inside for you. It still does the same that we did before, but it does it automatically. Correctly or incorrectly, we don't know. Right? We are relying now on the, the programmers and we believe, we believe that the programmers are smarter than us. Right? Which may not be the case all the time. So, good engineers still don't want to use auto meshing. They still prefer to use manual meshing, right? But in any case, it's because it's too leery. So, nodes level one, level two. Now we have level three, and actually level four already. Level four is we don't do even modeling. We simply import the drawings from AutoCAD from the architect and convert that into a model. We don't even bother to create the model anymore using the game concept, you know, building information modeling. The architects create the model, we bring it, import it into, into the software, run it. Don't know what happened, where, what is the, what it was, what was imported. You know, sometimes we, we have seen in some models, even the pipes get modeled. Drainage pipes were there in the drawing, that also got modeled. The small hole, if they put it, that also got modeled. Ridiculous, right? But that's how it's going. So, coming back to the elements. But obviously, we are doing more than that. So we need to understand. The most important thing in a model is joint connection. Ultimately, finite element software, as you know, only solves the solution at the nodes. Correct? So everything is converted into points and nodes. So node node is the key to the finite element analysis. And in between the nodes, there is an invisible connection coming from the element. And that is the properties, and that is converted. The stiffness is added back to the nodes, right? So these joints, we need to understand what are they and what we can do with them. 
So joints can be used to connect elements, joints can be used to apply loading, joints can be used to apply constraints or supports, joints can be used to disconnect elements, joints can be used to do a lot of things. So we need to understand what is the joint, how they work, what are their properties, you know. So I don't want to read this text. I expect you to read it. I'm just telling you the joints are the most important thing in a model. You must understand. In each joint, joint is not round. Joint has a local axis. So think of the joint as a cube, not as a point. Because if you think of it as a point, you lose the effect of the degrees of freedom, you lose the effect of the direction, and you lose the effect of the local coordinates. So never don't think of a joint as a, as a because there's no wrong round thing. It's a like a cube. Right? When you think of it as a cube, many things will come clear. So joints, location, coordinates can be located. Why is so important? We, of course, in the beginning, we didn't used to have this ability to rotate the local coordinates. Originally, planet element development, in fact, still deeper inside, everything is still global only one coordinate system. We go through many transformation matrices to convert from one to the other to the other, but ultimately they are all in global X, Y, Z. Right? So internally the joints are like that, but before we can do that, we need to have the ability to have to move the joints, rotate the joints. Why? Because sometimes the supports are inclined, sometimes the connections are inclined. So if there is an inclined support, you could not model, for example, this support without this one. Suppose there's a column and I want to model a roller support on an incline. If you do not have local coordinate system concept, you cannot model this because the coordinate, the roller is supposed to be, will only give you a roller in this direction and this direction and this, these are the three degrees of freedom. So if you want a roller here, there is simply no way that you can model this, right? So of course, when we used to model this without this one, we always have to find a trick to do this, right? You create some soft element here, so it's a roller, but you need to put, put a soft element which will allow it to move. So it will be like this, and here we will put an, a very soft element and lock it, which will allow this to slide in this direction. So there are tricks, tricks that we used to do, we had to do, because we didn't have this ability. But my point is that do not forget that the coordinates have local axis which you can change to match with the boundary conditions. Degrees of freedom, do I need to, remem to remind you degrees of freedom? No. How many degrees of freedom are there? Seven degrees of freedom. Okay, anyway, but most people do not consider warping a degree of freedom. Most programs do not do that. So let's say six. U1, U2, U3, R1, R2, R3. Three displacement, three rotations. Okay? So that is our key. 6 degrees of freedom, typically. Degrees of freedom can be active, restrained, constrained, null, unavailable. This, you really, really need to understand. What does this mean? Active. That means displacement is computed during the analysis. That means that degree of freedom is active. We are considering it. That particular direction is being used for calculation. Restraint. The strain means that the, that degree of freedom is not free to move. It has some kind of a block. The strain can be full or partial, linear or non-linear. So there can be many ways how you can restrain the degree of freedom. Completely free and completely fixed in between everything. Constraint. Constraint means that this degree of freedom can move but not independently, it must move together with some other degree of freedom. So there is a constraint. For example, if I want to move this table, 
all the points or all the degrees of freedom of every point must move together. So they are constrained in x direction and y direction to move together. But they are not constrained in vertical direction. Vertical direction, they, it, it can reflect. So they are not constrained. So constraint is when the degree of freedom in one direction, all of them are have the equal displacements. Right? So we can and this is a very powerful tool to eliminate many degrees of freedom, many elements that you don't need. For example, if you want to analyze these four columns, instead of putting this slab here and meshing it, you can just say top of these are constrained together and move together. Finish. Right? You don't need this anymore if you are not interested in the vertical displacement. And that is called the rigid flow diagram diagram concept, which people have been using for a long time to reduce the complete degrees of freedom by constraining the degrees of freedom by invisible links. So very powerful way to model stuff. Very powerful if you know how to use it. The strain, of course, none displacements does not affect the structure. They these are no not at all considered. So the degrees of freedom are ignored. And then unavailable, this displacement has been excluded from analysis. Right? Explicitly. For example, if it's a three-dimensional program, but you only want to do analysis in 2D, all the other degrees of freedom outside the plane can become un unavailable. Degrees of freedom which are flexible degrees of freedom. That means there is a support, but the support is not itself a rigid support. The support can is a soft support, which is Always the case. Soil is a soft support, right? So if you put it for footing on the slab, it is actually or on the soil. I'm sorry. The soil has a modulus of elasticity also. So that means the soil should be modeled by a spring, not as a fixed support. So you can replace the soil by a recumbent spring with the properties of the soil embedded in the spring. So that's why we can put the supports into spring supports. And it's a very good tool to model soils and other things. Again, in the beginning, this was not this we didn't use to have it, so we used to create a, we used to add a small element between the real element, change the moment of inertia and stiffness to match with the soil. So create an equivalent of spring, because element is also a spring, is a scale, right? But now we have it directly. So very important and very useful functionality in a support or is the sometimes the springs are not simple, they are coupled. That means in one direction movement is linked to the stiffness in another direction, just like orthotropic properties, anisotropic properties. So you need a stiffness matrix to define all the spring effect together, not independently. So we have this coupled spring issue when the soil or the foundations are such that movement in one direction will affect, for example, you want to use the soil, you have the vertical spring, but you also have a shear spring here for the soil. So now they are coupled. Right? So these are kind of things. So complex foundation conditions require coupled spring analysis. And then the problem is the same. Where do you get all the spring constants? It's easy to fill in this matrix, it's the data. But where do you get the numbers from? Nobody is going to give you these numbers. So that is the spring stiffness matrix. Easy to say, difficult to do. Okay, second one is the one line element. So, uh, so basically what we are saying is that we are dealing with one dimensional element in which we have the cross section and we have a plane perpendicular to the direction of the member in which the cross-section is located and the cross-section has properties um, which can be assigned to the line. So the line is only representing properties. That line is only there to represent properties that you can assign to that. Otherwise, it has no other meaning. It has no physical meaning. Line has no dimension, no thickness. It's just line. Just like point has no dimensions, line has only length, no dimensions. And dimensions are 
coming from properties calculated from the cross section connected to that line. Simple frame element, beam, column, truss, bracing, and then nonlinear element, we'll talk about that later, plus image elements. So a lot can be done with line elements because we have seven properties that we can manipulate. And because we can manipulate those seven properties, a lot of the things which we know can be incorporated. We can modify, for example, rear beam, you may calculate the property of moment of inertia, let's say area of cross section, you can play B to H, rectangle B. But if we know that this is going to be changed during any time or there is going to be some holes in it or some cracking in it, we can multiply it by a factor which is called property reduction factor. So we can say, okay, this is an area, but only 90% of that is affected. So we can multiply the area by 0.9. So very easy to modify the properties to include many things which will be very difficult to do in reality. But in that you cannot do in a solid element. Solid element is real dimension. So there's no room for manipulation. That is why many engineers prefer line elements because you can manipulate the properties to include a lot of behavior which otherwise cannot be included explicitly. So that is why when you are when you're going to use SAP or, or ETAP, sorry, you will find that it will ask you that this is the beam, what are the property modifiers? Am I going to use the same property that I calculate or do you want to multiply, modify it by some factors? And the building codes, ACI and other will give you a guideline on what property modifiers you should use. 2, 2D plus as 2D is a freedom, beam has this one, 2D beam has these two degrees of freedom, plus has these two degrees of freedom, and 3D frame has these two degrees of freedom. So basically, degrees of freedom for a line element at each node can be 2 or 3 or 6. Right? Okay, joint connectivity. So, this I and J is the way a frame or a line is created. You need two joints, start and end. And this is very important, which one is start and which one is end, because that defines the coordinate, local coordinate direction, and direction of the plane, and direction of the properties. Everything depends on how you number one to two, because the direction of major moment, minor moment, cross-section properties, everything will depend on that. So if you make a mistake in this or the angle of the properties, you can get into real trouble. And we used to get into real trouble when we didn't have the field graphics to show us how the beam is placed. So we think that we have placed the beam like this, but actually the beam will be like this. So minor moment of inertia will be here, major will be here. So we will get large deflection, not understanding what happened. And then we, oh my god, the node number is not correct. Go back and check the node number. But there was no way to verify until we have graphics. Of course, now you can see everything. It's easy. But still be careful in the direction of the local axis. And it's still very complicated to define what the local axis really means. For beam, it's easy. Beam is like this. This is major, this is minor. For column, quite difficult now. Because which direction is major, which direction is minor. And for the inclined column, you are completely lost. Because now the, there is no sense of where the major direction is. What is I big and I small? Or where is the beam's depth, where is the width? Right? If it's a rectangle beam, where is D and where is B? So to orient that properly in space, it's quite difficult, quite complicated, and you must read and understand how this is done in ETAPs before you start using it. Okay? 
there are many ways in ETABS or in SAP where you can define the direction of the major and minor. So please be sure. But luckily, because the graphics will show you, you can verify it. And if it doesn't, it is not what you want, you can change the angle. But originally, we couldn't see it. So we had a problem. Now, section properties. Section properties, originally we, we believe or we think that a line has uniform section properties from beginning to the end. Same section properties, that's why the element is made. Right? But in reality, these properties are not constant. Even if the cross section shape is not changing, the enforcement may be changing, cracking may not be the same. So, in fact, the properties are not constant along the length. They are changing at every section. Either the cross section dimension may be changing, like a inclined tapered column or tapered beam, haunch beam, or reinforcement inside may be changing, so equivalent properties will be different, or cracking may be different, so the cracking factor may be different at different sections. So in reality, the, the property, or all of them combined together. So in reality, the cross-section properties at every location along the line is not constant. So the problem is, how do you, what properties do you use for that line element, which is supposed to have one set of properties assigned to it, that's how it is to be developed. So, a very small issue becomes a major problem now. You can choose to close your eyes and say, oh, no, no, I only see cross rectangular cross section, I don't see the reinforcement inside, I don't see cracking, so I will use these properties to full length. But that's not true. At least now you know it's not true. So now you cannot close your eyes anymore. Okay. So, what do you do? And that is what I was telling you about the problem with using arbitrary section modifiers or properties. Because they are not real, they are not they are not constant along the length. And they are not the same for different load combinations, like different load conditions. For gravity load, different cracking, earthquake load, left direction, different cracking, right direction, different cracking. So how can you use the same cracking factors for the structure, for every loading, for every element? Correct? Code will tell you, beams use 0.3. But my beam is not cracking because it's a secondary small beam here. And that is a big beam, that will be cracking more than that. But according to the code, I'm supposed to use the same cracking properties. So it thinks my analysis actually is not correct because now the moment distribution got all mixed up. But I have no choice. But I'm, I have a very difficult choice. I could use full non-linear modeling if we can, but it will require a lot of work. So sometimes people have been trying to develop element which is isoperimetric formulation in which the properties can change along the length by a certain parameter and then you can develop the final, special finite element for those kind of things, right? There's such a certain shape function also trying to the properties. It is quite a challenge because the property change may not match with your shape function. Sometimes it changes abruptly, it goes up and down, it does not only reduce, it may or some tough part will go, in the beginning actually in a real beam, negative moment, if the properties go down, in the middle they become big for some portion, then positive moment cracking comes, then it goes, so it's a very, very complicated variation of the properties along the length. It's none of these that you see in your typical diagram. Okay? So that is why it's still an area not well handled. Then solution, we divide that into pieces and for each piece we use different properties, right? But then you need a lot of elements, a lot of like, extra effort to do that. So instead of using one beam element, we use five, six beam elements, each with different property modifiers. Too hard, but yes, if you have to, you have to. 
Another issue is this one. The portion of the beam and the column which are common, right, joint. So what is it? Is it the beam or is it a column? Are you going to include that as part of your beam or are you going to include that, that as part of your column? Or both or none? You might think oh, this is not a big deal, but it is a big deal because sometimes in tall buildings, especially the columns are very big. Like I said, 1.8 meter. 1.8 meter from there to approximately here. That is the size of the column. So how can you ignore that column or the beam? Because on that side also there is a big column. So in between, the beam is quite short. So if you ignore that, that means you are moment diagram, reflection, everything is wrong because you are increasing the beam span by one and a half meter. So which means that we have got to make adjustments. So typically what we do is that we consider the beam to start at the face of the column and start the, the column at the bottom of the beam, right? And we say these are the portion from here to here and from here to here is rigid. That portion is assumed to be rigid, non-deformable, separate kind of a connection. So beam element ends here and whatever the deformations are here are rigidly transferred to this point. And whatever the deformations are here are rigidly transferred to this point. So the joint is assumed to be rigid, rotating as if it cannot deform. True or false? False, right? So we start with a false statement, but we have no choice, or we have enough choice, but a hard choice. So we can use no offsets, we can use offsets, or we can use offsets with flexible connections. You can specify the connection to be a flexible one, partially rigid connection by putting some multiplier to that, just like property multiplier. But how do you calculate? What is the efficiency of a joint? How do you know what is joint is how many percent non rigid? Guess. Same, same problem, we don't know. We, every joint will depend on many things, many factors. So, very hard to do that. In steel connections, it is easy because steel connections, we can model this by a panel, panel zone with the dimension thickness of the plate, so it can be calculated. Concrete is a bit difficult, more difficult. Columns are big, beams are small, so but well, you know it's not that easy. And it's calculating the stiffness of that portion in concrete is difficult because of the cracking. So it becomes an issue. Normally for concrete we assume this to be rigid. For steel, we assume that to be flexible and we can calculate the flexibility by using the thickness of the connection plate, by using it as a panel zone. And we use rigid offsets. We start the beam and column after the joint. That is a typical way to do it. And sometimes we can have this kind of thing, as I said, this is rigid, this zone, or we can have a panel zone there. Right? So this is more clear, clear length, total length, and we do that. Of course, when, when we want to put in the beginning, this was very difficult to do that. So what would we do? We would model this by th three elements. One, two, three. This element, moment of inertia, increased by ten times compared to the beam to make it rigid. So artificially doing these things because the program did not have the function. Now we knew this problem, but the program did not have the option to specify rigid zones. So we used to create three elements there manually. So that, like I said, we had to find solutions for every problem which now the program can consider automatically. Sometimes the connection coming to between the column and the beam may not be rigid. It may be a flexible connection or a pin connection, right? 
or just a shear connection. So depending on that, we can use and release this. We can put axial shear torsion or moment release. So the degree of freedom coming from this beam to the column can be released one by one. You can release torsion, axial shear or moment or all of them. Right? So it is a good way to model pin connections and other things. So combination of rigid ends and end releases and flexible connections give you a lot of ability to model things the way you want. But still we have to choose what do we want. Right? So the program gives you all of that ability. So we can create now in multiple, so there is a whole big facility in ETAPS and SAP where you can model complicated variable section means by specifying different dimensions, different variations. So they have done a lot of work to solve the problem of the variable dimensions, variable cross sections. So you can do quite a good complicated modeling of variable, variable properties. They can be parabolic, they can be linear, many, quite comprehensive. A lot of work has been done. So, 1D elements can be used like that. You can use it in 2D frame, you can use it in 3D frame, or you can use it in 2D frame. Okay, we stop here. Questions? Comments?